We there there will be opportunity if, over the course if everyone anyone has a question on anything I said you can uh, you know feel free to raise your hand I'll try to moderate everything and here are some of the questions that we are going to discuss today. Question number one: Assuming I will be drinking on Purim, how much is too much to drink, and how much is too little? Ravosa. I want to begin, actually, because I was here at uh, Rav Elbaz Shlita's halachic blitz that just uh, occurred in this room, in this very spot, and I still feel the remnants of the sparks of holiness here. And I was actually, um, it, was, it was to my intrigue that he didn't touch upon this too, too much. So I wanted to just uh, take this opportunity for those that were here, for those who were going to look at the video later on, go back to the video, go back to the tape, and, uh, and just touch upon a couple of things, okay? Um, number one. First of all, I have to begin with, uh, this is my own personal take on things, so by no means am I an Allah decider, you should always take this to uh, Ravel Bas, Shlita, or the Rosh Hashiva. But my Masoira that I was makabal from my Rebbeim, my tradition that I got from my rabbis, is the oilum that steigs together, okay? The group of Yidin that grow and learn together, the oil that steigs together gets smashed together, okay? That's my Masoira, okay? That means by me, there's no question of will I drink, will I not drink. The only question is, how do I do it properly? So that, that's my own personal misoira. Um, uh, by the way, the oil that steigs together implies that you steig together first. So that means that if you're an yeshiva, so already you, you, know, you know what's going on. But for those days when you're not going to be in yeshiva anymore, it's just very important that when you're drinking and doing the mitzvah of Purim, that you're doing it amongst B'nai Torah. And that you're doing it with your family. Of course, you're steiging with your family. The biggest growth happens in your in your house and your bias. So just to keep that in mind, that we don't just celebrate Purim with anyone in any way, okay? Even when we're in full limits, that's number one. Next of all, um, uh, what are we drinking? First of all, just to be uh, the uh, Rav didn't touch on this, and anything goes really on Purim. But Rashi Kodesh says in the Gemara that the mitzvah min mufchar is with yayin that we want to drink wine. The Mishta was with yain. They had lots of wine from all over the world. And therefore, a person should ideally strive to get smashed in a holy way on yain. They've been ingesting yain in the form of Torah the whole year. Now it's time to get smashed on yain at the Suda, okay? And that's uh, the third caveat is when do you drink? Rav didn't touch on this too, too much. So I just want to just quote the Rav, just add on to everything beautiful that he said. And that is, and you should speak to the Rav again and clarify these things, and you should be getting smashed, if you're going to be getting smashed, and we'll talk about how to get smashed, at the Suda. And we'll talk about this more, I think, later on. You okay? may, Mr. You may. The days, not the nights. You may. The days, too. Yeah, okay. Is that you may, you may. Okay, so, so Day and not night. Right, okay, very good. So, very good. So, so it's like this. So, um, what's too much? If you disgrace any mitzvah, because you're too drunk, then that's called too much. So there's lots of examples, we don't have to do it for time's sake, but for instance, benching. If you don't bench properly, meaning you actually skip a whole bracha, or you forget to bench in, in, in Gansen totally, then that's not okay, you drank too much. Um, if you know before you started the suda that you didn't dive in mincha yet, and you get so drunk that by the end of the day you can't sober the daven mincha, then that's called, I'm sorry to say, um, too much. If you usually do my achronim, even such a thing, that's called being levaza mitzvah. You usually do it. Now, if you don't usually do it, that's okay. But if you usually do it, that and you don't do it because you're too drunk, that's not okay. That, that, and if you don't usually do it, and you do do it because you're too drunk, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, next, next, next. Forget about being levaza in a mitzvah. God forbid we don't do averas. And being drunk is not a hatred to do an avera. And therefore, if you're gonna, if you know yourself, and, and the Rav did speak with us, so I'm not gonna believe the point. If you know for yourself that you're going to use foul language um, or you're going to drunk call someone from your past, which has happened, don't do that. That's called too much. If you know yourself that that's what's going to happen, then give your buddy your cell phone. First of all, give your buddy your cell phone anyway and have your buddy give his buddy the cell phone and eventually end up somewhere where it's safe. But, but don't call anybody any time on Purim unless it's to tell them that you absolutely love them and it should be someone in your family. So, okay, so that, that's number one. Um, if it's going to lead to, okay, fine, we got, it, we got it. What's called too little? What's called too little? Too little, what's it Too little is like this. If you're allergic to alcohol or you have any kind of addiction history or you're recovering alcoholic, then 
then you should not drink. You should not drink. And the Rav uh, said this, but that, you know, that's, that's okay. That's not called too little. But if you don't have any allergies, and if you are not a recovering alcoholic or drug addict, and you have no issues mentally or physically with drinking, then if you drink nothing, that's called too little. That's called too little. Um, okay, very good. If you also are in this category, the latter category, and you only drink as much as you usually drink, let's say at a Shabbos Suda or at a Yom Tov Suda, then that uh, speaks to the rabbi, but that's probably called too little. Okay, what's called just right? So I'll just be very, very quick. It's very interesting. The Shari Tshuva brings uh, a Sefer, uh, which is the Siddur, called Amude Shamayim of the Yaivitz. And, the, and he brings there, the Yavitz, Rav Yaakov Emden, huge Tamil Chacham. He says, it's amazing, it's brought in the Mishnah Baruch. He says that his father, the Chacham Tzvi, who was a Goan, a giant, a genius. He says his father, when he was a Bachar, as you all are, fulfilled the mitzvah of Chay Avinish Lebesume Kipshuto. Meaning, the, the Chacham Tzvi, when he was a Bachar, L'Choyra got smashed. Got smashed. So I'm just saying that there is room for that, and that's, according to me, what's called too little, what's called too much. Sorry. Anyway. Um, self-control. Something called self-control, we speak about it a lot. There's a way to be, I don't, I'm not gonna use the word smash. There's a way to be busumeg. There's a way to be, be beyond your normal realm of consciousness your normal das, but still be in control. Once you've lost control and you actually don't know what you're doing and you're stumbling over, like, at that point you need to sit down and breathe and drink water, mm -hmm. that's called too much. The, for me, the, the category is too much is you've lost your sense of self-control, you can't, you physically, you, you're just falling over, you don't know what you're doing, you, you're saying things you just can't control what you're saying. There's gotta be a level of I've let down my inhibitions, I'm completely letting go of my ego, my inhibitions, my pain, my all that, whatever Adeloyada means, getting beyond higher than that. We, we always say you have to not know the difference between Arahaman and Baruch Mordechai, uh, curses is Haman and, and blessed is Mordechai. My, my wife and I always said that if we were going to have twin boys, we'd call one Baruch Mordechai and one Arahaman <laughs> to see how that works out. In all. Sociological experiment. <laughs> Luckily, God didn't give us twin. <laughs> but there's something called being below das, which means you just get wasted, get very boisterous and arrogant, and then drink a bit more, and then your pain comes out and you throw up and pass out. And that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about going to a place of super consciousness, not below. So I'm going to be super conscious. But in a place of super consciousness, which means I'm so beyond my normal analytical, this is good, this is bad. I'm just hopefully stepping into a place of everything's good, everything's from Hashem. Therefore, you're in a place of higher control, higher self-control, because your self, your neshama, is in control, rather than your ego and your pain and your past. So too much is you've lost self-control. Too little is where you're, you're too much in self -control, ego self-control. It's like, I want, I'm putting on a persona, I need to be a certain way. So you want to be drinking, also by the way, drinking very slowly. There's no chug, 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 chug. That's why we also say vodka, whiskey. You're not taking shots. This isn't a frat party, there's no shots. You're drinking with someone else who said to me, are we drinking out of a bottle or out of a glass? No, you're a Jew, you drink out of a glass. You're a, there's a cross, there's a vessel to receive the holiness. No, they're not chug, chug, chugging here. There's Drinking like a mensch, you're going to drink like a mensch much more than you usually drink and very slowly take yourself into a space of higher consciousness, higher self control. That's sure. So much has been mentioned, but it has to be mentioned. Rabbein Ephraim, the Gemara says that Machai Vinish Lubasume, the Pariah, Adaloya Dabin, Arahaman, the Boch Mordechai, that you should drink. Well, it doesn't say drink, it says you should get spicy. Besume, you should get spicy, place of a fragrant, spicy. And, and you don't know the difference between Arahaman and Baruch Mordechai, which is a very high level, seemingly, of intoxication, according to Rashi. And then immediately it says a story of Rabbah, Rav, Rava, 
and they get together on Purim, and uh, Rabbi gets up, and they're drinking, and Rabbi gets up and he shechs Reb Zeira. It's simple, we'll talk about it tomorrow in our shir, is that he shechs him. We'll talk about in Pshutai, maybe he shechted him, Manish. And then the next day, it doesn't happen on the spot, the next day, he uh, is boy Rachamim, and then he resurrects him. And in the next year, Rabbi comes back to Reb Zeir and says, so you're going to have Purim by me again, right? He says, miracles don't happen all the time. You know, thank you very much. I'm, I'll, I'll pass this year on Purim together. Thank you. So Ben Ephraim says, because of the Uvda, because of what happened in the Gemara, it's clear that the Chiv of a Rabbi was reneged. And it doesn't have to say that it's reneged, because if I tell you, you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z, and then I tell you a story about somebody doing X, Y, and Z, and something horrible happened to them, it's obvious I don't have to tell you that when I told you X, Y, and Z, I'm reneging on X, Y, and Z. So Rabbein Ephraim says, the entire halacha is gone. Whether it's Adaloyada or the whole halacha of Machayi Inish Lebesume. I think what that means, on a simple level, is like the Rabbanim were saying, if a person's going to get to a place that, like my Rebbe always says, the faster it goes in, the faster it comes out. If a person's going to go into this in a certain way that he's going to do things that are not appropriate to his dignity, and a Jew is a, is a ben melech, is a king, and if he's going to get to a place that he's going to do things that are not appropriate to the surah eloki, to the godly image of who he is, to the king inside or the princess inside for a woman, then it's better he shouldn't drink because that's not good. And he doesn't know how to handle it properly. Really, Purim, you need 364 days to get ready. We have only a few more days, which means you have to cry a lot. Dav and Hashem, I want an emistic of Purim. Because I want to drink properly. The mig is, many of the tzaddik and mamish drink. They, they drink. They, they, they properly drink. Like kipshutai. They drink. Because they can and because they're crying for Purim, they're davening for Purim. I need an emistic of Purim. Hashem, help me drink properly, and you should all be davening now. I need an emistic of Purim. Because one Purim, if you do it properly, you'll never be the same person ever again. There's so much tshuva. Purim is Yom Kippurim. It's a day, Yom Kippur is just like Purim. It's the biggest day of the year. Please. Hashem, I want so much tshuva, me'ava, it's Kabbalah Satara, me'ava. You have to daven now and cry for Purim. Get me into that sweet zone. I don't want to be like this keg party. I don't want to have these old memories. And if a person starts drinking, the chidah, the yurtzeit today, the chidah says that every year the, on Purim, the Sahara dresses up like somebody. <laughs> Watch out for him. He's going to be at the Purim party. It's usually the guy with the, the, what's the stuff called? The Fernandez or something. It's the, something, some black liquid. And one of the guys goes, yo man, you want some of this? <laughs> so watch out for that guy. Like, I got something, you want it? Shkoya, freiluch, and buram, Rebbe. And then just run. The other way, fast. I don't want, I want a mamish, emistik, puram, please. So be careful of him. And to daven for it, to go to that sweet place where all the good things will come out. You need a lot of that. At this point, you just have to daven as hard as you can for it and stick a Purim. Okay, amazing. Okay, um, Purim costumes. So uh, why do we have Purim costumes? And when choosing a Purim costume, um, what is the fine line between imitating someone in a mocking way and choosing like a fun costume? Is there any type of lines also when it comes to the costumes? Okay, so again, all I can tell you is what I received from my Rebbeim. There's a lot written on the subject, obviously, but uh, I'm here for a reason. I want to tell you what, what I received and what I experienced and what worked for me. Um, what works for me and my answer is that you should wear mechubad clothing, honorable, dignified clothing for an honorable and dignified occasion. Yeah, I'm the grouch, you know, I'm sorry, that's just me. 
no judgments if you come in wearing, uh, you know, the pregnant nun outfit. I won't, I won't judge you. I won't judge you. I will, I will laugh and I will dance with you. <laughs> right. So, so what my answer is, is that uh, we wear Big Day Shabbos. It's a Yom Tov. Uh, Big Day Yom Tov if you have that as well. Um, with a twist, you can wear a mask. A mask is ideal, and I'm sure the Rabbana will discuss the, the whys and and particularly a mask is very appropriate for the day. Um, um, now, again, it's a long discussion, but at the end of the day, it seems that there is room to wear women's clothing and cross-dress. It seems that there is room to dress like a priest. Again, in all of the different discussions, the, 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 drug, the drunk po pope, all these things, at the end, I can't tell you you can't do that because there is a lot of room for that, but it's highly, highly, highly discouraged Number one is halakhically, not everybody agrees you could do that, and you're tiptoeing the line of Isuri de Oraisa, multiple Isuri de Oraisa, so that's number one. Um, the next issue that I found is more of just a, a practical issue, and it'll take away from your day um, and the opportunity, the great opportunity of the day, which is that oftentimes I've found that when people wear outfits, they, they find it funny to role play. The outfit becomes like the theme of the day for them. And then they end up uh, speaking in funny accents and doing silly things that are uh, in accordance with the outfit. What are you doing? We're trying to find ourselves. We're trying to connect to Am Yisrael. We're trying to connect to our history, to our present, and then to our future, Bez Hashem. Based on Migdash, you want to just say the Kohen Gadol, then yeah, you can role play if you want to, you know? But at the end of the day, if you're going to dress like a pirate and just go be going, arg, matey, all day, and you know, like spilling everything everywhere. It's funny, people will laugh, you'll probably have a great time, we'll all have a great time, but I think that you will have a superficial perm at the end of the day. If you dress like a pirate, right, and at the end of the day you still have, uh, you still tap into the, to this, what perm is there to give you, then matogo manayim, it's fantastic, you were makayim everything. I just find that when people wear outfits, we have so many memories of other holidays where we have to dress up, and it's so interwoven in our psyche of, you know, I dress up and this is how I behaved in the past. And it just creeps in, especially when we drink, unfortunately. I, I personally uh, uh, would discourage it. That's my approach. What's the pirate's favorite letter? R. I knew you'd say that, but really it's the C. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the Holy Rebbe, he mentioned, um, he mentioned the word for, to dress up in Hebrew is lehit chapes, lehit chapes, which literally means, chapes means to look for, and lehit is something you're doing to yourself, it's reflexive. So to dress up in, in, in Jewish is to look for yourself. I'm looking for myself, I want to express myself. Now Halloween... Halloween is basically get dressed up as something evil and ask people to give you things, trick or treat, and if they don't give you things, you destroy their car. Apparently. <laughs> in England. <laughs> Halloween, that's Halloween. Dress up as evil and be a taker. Purim's all, all about being a giver. That's the whole Mishrach Manas, Matanas Levianim. It's about being a giver. Connect to your Nisham. When the wine goes in, the secret comes out. What's the secret? What's hidden is your neshama. So I would suggest on, Pur on Purim we do the opposite. You dress up as, as holy stuff. You dress up as neshama. You dress up as, you want to find yourself and express yourself. And then you, give, you, go, you dress up as holy and you go around giving. They dress up as evil and they go around taking. We dress up as holy and we go around giving. And that's really, I'm going to find myself. And the whole inyan of, getting, of, of dressing up is almost laughing at ourselves in a way because we wear, you're wearing masks all year. Your persona. I'm the spiritual meditation traveler, funny rabbi mask that I wear. And so that's funny. That's a joke. So, so what we're trying to do is to go deeper within ourselves and actually, in a way, express who we want to be, in a way. I dress up as the Spiderman Rebbe. I have a Spider-Man Bekisha. I do. My, my father-in-law is a fashion designer. He got a duvet and made a Spider-Man Bekisha. And I wear it every year. Spider-Man Bekisha. Try them on. And I like, because that expresses who I want to, I want to be, you know. With great power comes great responsibility. I can for that. I like that. And I'm, I've got a stickle chassid in me. I, like, so I, I express that. I think that's, 
very healthy and holy, that's what we're trying to do. In terms of halakhically, um, you can't dress up as, as an individual. To, say, to dress up as Rav or something, I don't think that's okay. But I think to dress up as a type of Jew. Uh, uh, but not to make fun of them, just to say that I see an idea of being a chassi, I'll get some players a little bit. Um, I think that that's more okay, because it's just... But to dress up as someone specific, and also, as he was saying, like, I'll, I'll be Robin Hood. Uh, my, what's that, Shaykh? It's not a fancy dress party. So that, that's not why we're dressing up. The dressing up is like, Hashem is hidden in nature, and Hashem is revealed through nature. So our clothes hide us, and they reveal us. So that's what we do. It's, there's a deep, sweet thing about it. So just to be like, I'm going to dress up as a clown, or a rabbit, then maybe a clown. There's an Indian in the Gomorrah of being a clown, and I'll have a bike, right, whatever. But you should think about it. What am I trying to express through my dressing up? Not just, I'm going to a fancy dress party. The Oy Yisrael, I suggest people, if they want to see a little bit about dressing up, look in the Oy Yisrael, one of the students from the line of the Baal Shem Tov. He talks about in Parshish Zohar, Purim. He mentions that the first time we find something very funny in the Torah is that Yitzchak is born. And Yitzchak is the son of Avram. Yitzchak's name is funny. His name is funny. Yitzchak means to laugh, or will laugh. Yitzchak. Now the question is, what's so funny about Yitzchak? So he points out that, a little bit more Kabbalistic, but Avram Avinu, represented a certain quality of giving, of chesed, of tent open on all four sides. And we understand that likeness gives birth to something that's like it. Maisa ava simila bonim. You usually like your parents. Usually you'll catch yourself all of a sudden, like in a moment of usually stressful situation. Oh my goodness, that was my dad. Because we come from them. So when Yitzchak was born, and he was the power of Gevura, something totally opposite, that was very funny. And if you notice, look in the psukim, everybody's laughing during the birth of Yitzchak. Sarah's laughing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm 89, I don't have a baby. Everyone's laughing around Yitzchak. Why do you laugh? What's the idea of laughing? So somebody will send you a video on YouTube that has five billion hits of a guy slipping on a banana. Why are you... And it's, why are you laughing? You're sick. The guy might be hurt. Help him up. You start laughing. The guy slipped on a banana. That's very dangerous. But we start laughing about it. What's so funny about the guy slipping on the banana? What's the answer? You didn't see it coming. You imagine when a guy walks down the street, he's going to keep walking down the street because that was the status quo. You walk and you keep walking down the street. You don't expect the, banana, the guy just to flip upside down. So f laughter comes when you don't expect something. It's Adar Adar. When something is opposite, something flips around. All of Purim is things are going one way, it looks like the Jews are going to be destroyed, and on the same gallows that we're going to hang Mordechai, so Haman's hung. Everything is flipping upside down. And that's funny. There's nothing funny when you see a, uh, a person walking down the street who is a woman. It's not funny because she's a woman. But if somebody walks in who's not a woman, dressed up as a woman, that's very funny. <laughs> if I were to be wearing a tie right now, that would probably be funny. Because <laughs> you don't see me in a tie. <laughs> if I were to somehow walk in, you know, upside down on my hands, just I just walked right in the front door, you know, like my old breakdancing days, literally walking to the front here on my hands. That would be funny because you don't usually walk to, to the desk on your hands, you walk on your feet. Even though it's not, you know, that's because it's not what you expect. So one of the ideas of dressing up on Purim is that tzchoik is everything is opposite. And the Shem is showing on Purim that in one second everything can flip from one thing to the other. In one second you think the world is coming to an end. In one second something challenging is happening in your life. Literally, there's everything is going wrong for the Jews in one second. Could be at the highest heights. You're in a, in a moment of tremendous distress, and in one second you can go to the highest place. In one second, from, from the lowest, lowest place, 
become the, the king of, of Mitzrayim. So in Purim, you can literally go, that's why so much money changes hands. A poor person can become a rich man like that on Purim. He goes around just asking for money. Hey, Yankel, you had no money. Now you're driving around in a Beamer. Yeah, it was Purim. I just, I just, I just put up my, I just put up my hand. Everyone just gave me tons of money. I'm rich now. On Purim, everything can flip around in one second. The dressing up is a hint of all of that. I used to say the other way around. The guy who was driving around in a Beamer <laughs> smashed it on Purim. He realized he was a woman. So therefore, you're not allowed to dress up as a woman. So therefore. Uh, the reason why that halachically we don't dress up as a woman, like the Rabbanim was saying, that there's halachic questions is because there's a couple things. We don't want you sneaking into the women's gallery because it, the question's so good. And there's other maybe reasons as well is that uh, we could talk about afterwards that it might not, not be a healthy expression. But other things that you wouldn't expect him to wear, there's something funny when you walk in, not in your regular uh, penguin suit. Okay, next question. How can I be certain that on Purim I'm experiencing the actual essence of the day and not just simply experiencing my, my taivas for food, for drinking, etc.? Okay, so I'll just quote uh, a, fr a friend, uh, a role model of sorts, a former H. Talmud, uh, Rabbi Daniel Katz, and he said the best way not to have a spiritual experience is to try to have a spiritual experience. That's like the best way to fail, right? So when I saw the question, I uh, automatically, uh, my answer was, I don't know, I don't, I don't think about it, um, following that, uh, that advice. Um, I'll just tell you something that says in the Mishavur and the Shulchan Aruch, the Ramah brings down, Echad Amarbe ve'echad Mamayit He's talking about drinking. Some people drink a lot on Purim. Some people don't drink so much. They just drink a little bit. And as the Ramah says, drink a little bit more than you usually drink. Go to sleep afterwards and you don't have das. So you're good to go. You definitely are Yossi the Halacha that way. Drink a little bit more than you usually do. Go to sleep. But then he says, if you drink a lot or you drink a little bit, what, what really matters the most is that you have your heart intended towards Shemayim. What does that mean? Towards spiritual potential towards Ratzon Hashem, towards the will of our Creator, towards the purpose of the day. And so I personally find that if you're thinking too much about your taivas, uh, you're going to abstain on the day of Purim from the Gishmaka piece of meat or from the cake. I don't think it's a time for fasting. It's actually usr. The question concerns me in so much as you should have a great holy time on Purim. I think, that's my opinion, if you're healthy and you can, you should drink a lot, you should eat a lot, you should enjoy. And why are you doing this? Always have it in your mind, the goals of the day. The goals of the day, which we'll speak about, maybe I'll personally speak about, we've been speaking about um, later on uh, in the further questions, but have in mind everything you've learned up until now, have in mind the greatness of the miracles that Klaus Rowe experienced, have in mind our mission as a people. And I personally think that if you're worried too much about this, and it's, it's not a day of Musr, my taivas, and I, I personally don't think that you should worry about it. And all the more so that you're in such an environment in the yeshiva this year, where we're all together and we're in the yeshiva and we're in our campus across from the Makom HaMikdash, the Harabayas. I personally think that, and that's my opinion, that if you think too much about this and you're too focused on, uh, uh, you know, the food and the sugar count and the calories and the I, I think that it'll get you into more trouble than it will be beneficial to you. That's my personal opinion. You're all B'nai Torah. I think your hearts are in the right place. I think go for it, enjoy. And uh, as long as the conversation is Divrei Torah, the songs are Torah Dika songs. And, uh, and there are, yeah, that's my opinion. Hashem? Let me see the I'll talk to you later. I just got married. No? Thanks. So, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Taiva. Favorite word. Favorite uh, word. The difference between Aineg and Taiva is what you're thinking about. What's your motivation and what you're thinking about? It says, Lisaneg al Hashem. You should have, Aineg is on Hashem. That's it. 
So the difference between taiva and oneg, taiva is you're thinking about yourself. And oneg is you're thinking about Hashem. Now you can eat exactly the same amount and exactly the same food. You can eat your sugar in it. I agree, don't start with, but is what, what are you thinking about? What are you eating? Another big difference is taiva, whilst you're eating what you're eating, you're thinking about what's come, what you're going to be eating next. I mean, I've got that, and then, <laughs> and I've got the next fork ready, and I, <laughs> I love you, <laughs> So, Oneg is, Oneg is you're not thinking about what's coming next. Oneg is just, you're there. You're being present in the moment. Very big difference. Litaneg al Hashem. Oneg is, and the Oneg of food, people say Oneg Shabbos is food, but it's Litaneg al Hashem. It's the food that Hashem gave you. The nitzotzos, the kedusha, the holiness of the food. So, hundred percent. It's not about what you eat; it's about how you eat. It's not about what you eat, how you eat. If you're eating to tap to reveal Hashem, the whole day is about revealing Hashem and Yonashama. If you're eating to reveal that, then then that's, you're tapping into Oineg. And if you're eating just to get some physical pleasure for your own selfish thing, you're tapping into Taiva. The Rabbanim Shlita said everything. If this is what the Ramah means, the Levad Shiachav and Libay Lashamayim, just be around people that are talking about God, and the rest will fit into place. Okay. What is the ideal way to prepare for my Purim Suda to be in the right zone when the Suda comes, when the moment comes? There was a shear by Rav Zucker Shlita going around uh, the WhatsApp world. By the way, I have to say at this moment, WhatsApp is a fantastic thing. It's also a horrible thing. Depends how you use it. I was at a seum at Rav Gav, who we desperately miss uh, here at Ishtar, personally, that's me. But Rav Gav, Baruch Hashem, I get to see him every But Rav Gav said, when you make a seum, we say, Anu Ratzim, Vehem Ratzim. We run and they run, right? We had a seum today, by the way. Mazel Tov said it in the sign of the present. Yeah, Mazel Tov. Yeah. So Rav Gav, Rav Gav Friedman Shlita said, "On the WhatsAppen, the heim WhatsAppen," because he has a giant, uh, he has a giant WhatsApp group of the daft. He gives the daft to like hundreds of people, so just want to throw that out there. Um, but uh, it was floating around the the WhatsApp world of Zuckers uh, how to prep for for Purim. Um, so I'm not sure if he said this or not, but uh, I think that uh, following in his in his advice is um, one should for sure. Uh, study the Masechta of that uh, of that Yom Tov. Now, uh, like he said, we're right before the, the Chag, and if this is a news to you, so you don't have time to learn the whole Masechta. Um, but at least learn some of the Mishnayos. Um, and if not the Mishnayos, I would personally recommend uh, the Sugyas that we're doing in our Shir, which is the Agadatas that are explaining more in depth of what happened at the Suda and darshaning all the Psukim. Because as we spoke about, um, the, the Megillus Esther is uh, representative of the close, closing of the Torah Shiv Iksav and the transition into the Torah Shiv Al Peh. That has a lot of significance, going from Nevua to Chachma, from the Nevi'im, the prophets, to Chachamim, to the sages, going from um, light, a great light in the world, to a great darkness, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so learn the Masechta, learn the Torah Shiv Al Peh of... Uh, it's related to that day in the in the way of our tradition. That's number one. Um, number two is um, the the actual Purim story in the Megillah itself. It, it helps you uh, pay attention when you're when you're listening to the to the Megillah, and it helps you actually have what to say at the Suda when you are uh, uh, very very in tune with what was happening in the in the Megillah. So the Megillah is written in such a way, by the way, that it's very um, obscure. The Megillah is written in such a way that it's very obscure, and that's for political reasons. How the document was written, when it was written, doesn't mention God's name in it. Actually, the Megillah has almost no religiosity to it. it very few mitzvahs and uh, and Jewish stuff. Actually, if you look through the Megillah, is mentioned because it was written for the general audience of of, uh, of the time of the residents of Shushan and the surrounding areas. So you have to know what's happening in the Megillah, and that'll give you also what to say, what to speak about. Um, in terms of the deeper Torah about the, the Megillah. I recommend a sefer called Moam Loez, um, which has a collection of Midrashim um, and Chazals and uh, different Rabbanim uh, about the, the depth of the day, but also speaking to the Pshat and really getting you to understand um, what's happening. So 
Again, call me a big litvak, but the way to prepare for the Purim uh, Suda is by learning about Purim. And uh, last but not least, you just have to say this as uh, part of the Rebbeim and the Hall and the Yeshiva here, is that uh, you should definitely be at Rav Zucker's Tish. You'd be crazy not to be at Rav Zucker's Tish before the Purim starts. Where else in the world are you going to be? So if you want to prepare for the Purim Suda, you should be at the preparatory Tish that's going to be led by Rav Zucker. And I have to say this. The tish is not a pregame. So again, call me a grouch, you know, don't call me a slouch, but uh, you're not pregaming before the Suda. You want to get nice and desume with your Rebbe at the Suda, after washing Hamotzi, after getting some bread inside of you. Our sages say that, that Lechem, that Halacha is likened to Lechem, that Torah is likened to Lechem, and only then you drink the wine. Because, which is what? Really representative of Kabbalah. The wine is representative of Kabbalah. And I say to say that if someone drinks too much wine before they have any bread, so what happens to them? They look like a fool, they get sick, and they look like the description that Rav Bear painted for us. And you don't want to look like that, and you don't want to be sick, and, uh, and therefore, you get uh, nice and good with your Rebbeim at the Sudas, but you have to be at the pregame tish and pregame spiritually, and I think that's the best way to uh, prepare for the for the Purim Suda. 130. 130. Yeah? Minchas at 130. It's also the prep. It's also the prep. And at 240 in case you missed that. Well, the more so reason not to drink at the, at the pregame. Um, you cannot enjoy your Purim Suda knowing that you didn't contribute to someone else's Purim Suda. Matanis Levionim giving gifts to the poor is the most important mitzvah of the day. I don't know if uh, halachic authority would say that, but the Rambam says there is no greater simcha than making the drought downtrodden happy. So me personally, I just in general talk about this, I work out how much am I spending on my costume, my Mishloach Manas and my Suda. And then I take that amount and I double I don't double it, I give that amount to someone else for their suda. So for me, that I, I, I don't feel comfortable going into my Suda unless I know I've at least contributed to someone else's Suda. Main, main thing. Second thing is the Suda and therefore the drinking is on Sunday day. Ah. Motsi Shabbos ah. is probably the number one day of the year to not drink. It's the number one. Just like before Pesach, you don't eat Matzah. And before you get married, you don't see your wife for seven days. Before before the day of the Purim, this Dafka Saturday night is number one, don't drink anything night. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. I believe that very, very strongly. So you'll have to find other types of stuff to do that. Don't do that. So the number one, those are the two ways to prepare. Third way to prepare, and there's always, this is all the word, the word, the word, Achana, preparation, is the same gematria as ma'ach and lev, head and heart. So how do you prepare in your ma'ach is to understand the day. How do you prepare in your heart is to yearn for it. Understanding yearning. So you got to be very excited. I'm really, I'm, the more you look forward to something, my daughter looks forward to her birthday all year. The day after her birthday, she's like, am my next birthday? Well, there it is. She's yearning for her birthday, yearning for her birthday, yearning for her birthday. So we're yearning for Shabbos. On Sunday, we start yearning for Shabbos songs. Yeah. So yeah, I'm really, really deeply excited for this event. So you're yearning, you're understanding it, you're helping other people, and you're, you're holding back to the, the relevant time to actually pursue. The Rabbi Mamish again said everything. That it's so important not to drink the night before Purim. People think, it's Purim! And most associations is that the night time is the good time to be involved in whatever the party is, whatever the, the matzav is. And sadly, they tell me that uh, the night is when all the crazy parties and the, and the DJ whoever's are playing. And it's the absolute worst time. It's the best way to sabotage all the holiness of Purim. There is a halacha to have a cup of wine. It has a din of suda, of yom tev but no more than just you would have uh, one glass of wine. You're going to have some meat on Motzei Shabbos. It's also a Malav Malka. 
but it's there's no inyan bechlal of mishte, and uh, you know there were Jews that all of other would drink, but that is a whole different thing. For the Amcha Beis Yisrael, just spend that night. Many people stayed up, just sing to Hillam, learning that night. That's the best night that you want to just be in a place of kedusha. Stay up late learning that night. Make a chavrusa on Motzi Shabbos with somebody to learn a few hours together. Uh, I do find that people really do well with there's a sefer of uh, Yosef Deutsch. Is that it? Uh, let my nation, uh, let my nation serve me. He basically writes as a novel. He has on I think on almost every one of the chagim a novel of taking you through the life as ki'ilu, like you're in Shushan. And he, he guides you. What do they call this? It's like a, a, it's not a fiction, real, historical fiction, like, but it's real. With all the midrashim and all the chazals, and you're moving through Purim. A lot of people have found it very successful. Get that book now. They'll probably all sell out after this year in, uh, in, uh, in the, in the uh, Mariah and you read the whole thing cover to cover in the next couple of days, you'll feel like you're in a whole other level of, uh, of Purim consciousness. As well, we have, uh, as, I, as I remember, of Eitan Katz, Shlita is gonna be, uh, is gonna be guiding us on uh, say Shabbos as well. Just hearing him sing and, and play is, is, for me, it's therapeutic. It's, it's like, it, it's, much it's, than it's, yeah, much more expensive <laughs> than therapy. He's a good therapist. Okay? You pay for good therapists. And, uh, and his meditative is, uh, it's unbelievable. So go to that and allow the music to heal you. Allow the music. He's going to be guiding. It's a guided meditation. It's not, it's not, it's not going to be a concert. Does it say concert? It's not active. It's not a concert. It's, it's a guided meditation of taking you into the Kupuram consciousness. Should be Zaycha. Can you just say one thing? Because we, I, I see we have a lot of time and I want to, we're going to open up for questions, live questions as well. If we have time. I just want to say one. that. The Vaitan Katz, I still remember very, very clearly Rav Shechaim and I went to see Rav Eitan Katz Shlita, huh? uh, performing the Ramada. The Ramada. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, live in Shalim. To this First very one. day, it's, it's just one of the highest experiences of my life. Um, so, so that's that's um, we're there. That is there. Yeah, right. Hashem gave him a koyach of Megina. That's so. And the yeshiva, you guys are in the best place in the world. I just wanted to stress this: you're in the best place in the world. You're the best people in the world taking care of you, night and day. The, the rabbis here of El San, of Rossman, everybody, Rabbi Collar, everybody, Rabbi Miller. They're all Rabbi Katz. They're all thinking about you nonstop. Everything we mentioned. 7.45 to 9 o'clock, Yeshiva's Mordechai at Tzadik, set up a Hevusa ASAP. Like, just hop the best guy in Yeshiva, you know? The best mitos, the best discipline, and just learn, learn. And then, I just want to say something amazing that I heard the other day, which is that, that Achashverosh, when he set up his Suda, his Mishta, for 180 days, he satisfied everybody's desires, and all the senses were completely just uplifted, except for one. It's a fascinating thing that I never knew about is that although there were beautiful tapestries hung for the eyes to see and the couches were just supple for the body to experience and obviously the food and drink and the smells, he filled the, the garden with the most beautiful roses. And one thing that was not, the ears. The ears got nothing from the surahs of Ahasuerus. Nothing at all. There was no music playing. You think of a royal banquet, you think of a... There was no music at all being played during the royal banquet for 180 days. Incredible. And the reason why, just to share a little bit, is because he did not want, the last thing that Achashverosh wanted was that a Yid should be inspired to do tshuva and to come to feelings of Amos Hashem. And that's what music does, is music brings us to a higher level and therefore it's so appropriate and so amazing that Megid, that terrible Russia, and everything they did is the night of Purim where having Mamash a concert with, I'm sure there's going to be a fantastic sound system and top-notch everything, hopefully. <laughs> and it's going to be just the best. And so when you're, when you're singing your heart out and crying to Hashem at, at that concert, or not concert, meditative musical meditation, just think, 
Yeah. You, you, this this one's for you, Haman. This next one's for you. In your face, Achashverosh. Okay. I just had to add that in. It's so beautiful. I love that. Amazing. Okay, how should I plan to end my day on Purim after all the pseudos, drinking, partying, and dancing? How should Purim end? My Rabbi always says, he quotes, Kitaiv Daidech Meyayin, like it says in Shir Shir and Mishakenim in the Shikas Pil, Kitaiv Daidech Meyayin, that even better than the wine is the Adidas, that there's almost like this post Purim come down. As you know, the yain is just sort of ebbing, and you're just in this place. That's usually where I end up, just by my rabbi. And there's a certain feeling of like, ein oid melavadai kipshutai. There's nothing but you, Hashem. You want to know that in a certain way, after the yain, there's like a come down and a certain buzz of just integration, meditation, being in a holy space, go to the Kaisel and just sit by the Kaisel, be with the Rebbe, just be in an environment that even better than the Yenai of Purim is the Yedidis, that you could feel something even more special in the come down. So be in a holy setting, go to the Kaisel, be with loved ones, and just allow yourself to feel this Yedidis. You don't have to have a safer open, you don't have to be doing anything, just give yourself space to feel the come down of the Yain of Purim. Um. We always want to, there's great light and spiritual energy on the holy day itself. We always want to know how to then bring that overflowing into our life. So first, this is one just to sit with it and um, you don't want to end up Purim passed out in a bath. So that's not what you want to do. You want to end up Purim in, as he said, in a state of higher consciousness, but then and I've read this, I'm not sure where I've read this, to take something upon yourself. So I, gonna, I now want to check, I want to be a bit different. I'm going to drink a little bit less now that I've drunk here. I'm going to, I don't know, one, what, take, say I want to change. There's something that through this experience has shifted in me, and I'm going to represent that by being different in one area of my life. Just a little thing. Always take on a little thing and, and there's a shift. And to say this is mamish, this is the, the Kabbalahs at that time of Yedidus of just s something, it's such a time of Kedusha, accept upon yourself something that goes all the way through you. Duch and duch, all the way in, I want to do this. Negobas are by my bed, whatever. I want that, I want it to be something that it's Kudsh Malamita, whatever it is, and just that it hits you in that place. It's a very auspicious time to do that. We know that the famous Ari, the saying of the Ari, one of the famous sayings of our, of our Rebbe, the Ari Kaddish, says that, uh, a person, that a person should know that the Kedusha of, of Yom Kippur is only like the Kedusha of Purim. You've heard, I'm sure by now, if you haven't heard now you heard it, um, what that means, it needs a lot of uh, uh, explanation, but one thing that's clear is on Yom Kippur, the Iker is, the, the primary idea of Yom Kippur is to do the Tshuva, but to walk away a different person. So just echoing this idea that, that on Purim, which is like Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, which is like Purim, a person should walk away with a Kabbalah, which is the ideal takeaway, uh, literally, of, uh, of, of Yom Kippur. Now, I would say, not to disagree, not go last but I know it's just examples, those are fantastic, and, and, and if you could do more than one, you should do more than one, but don't do too much. The key is little steps at a time. But there's a famous rush, Rabbeinu Asher, who was a, a Godel, who was actually an Ashkenazi, who was the head of a Sephardi community, the chief rabbi, so you know he's great, you know, everybody loved him, he's amazing, one of the Godel, he doesn't need my skama. So he says famously that the mitzvahs bein Adam lechaveiro are even greater than the mitzvahs bein Adam lemakom. He says, why? Because a mitzvah bein Adam lechaveiro between you and your fellow person are also a mitzvah between you and a Kaddish Baruch Hu. 
So therefore, I, I think that especially the day of Purim, which is, which is one where we focus so much on the Achdus, uh, on being together, on unity, uh, and to get banding together to overcome any negative uh, decree, to, uh, to, to overcome any challenges in, in Gullus and the exile that we're facing. I think that um, it's also appropriate to, to, to retro, you know, just to reflect uh, in that state and to think about where am I lacking in my personal relationships with others. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be a Rebbe, it could be somebody at the yeshiva, it could be anybody. Uh, I think that's appropriate as well. That just reminds me, just to make sure, there's, there's, there's no getting in fights on Purim, correct? No fighting on Purim, no getting angry on Purim? Sure. <laughs> no, let it all go. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No fighting, nothing. It doesn't matter. It's the best day to just go over to your friend. That's what give Mishloch Manus. Dafka to the people that you're not so, you know, close to. Give to the guy that's like, you know, in yeshiva, that like something happened one time and like, yeah, you know, you know, you. Give me shalom manas. Remember, 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 shalom <laughs> I'm never going. Yeah, man, I'm never. Blinada, blinada. But I'm not going to drink any alcohol ever again apart from wine. Or just maybe a lachaim at a bris, something like that. But I think that's a very holy one. Why? Is it, <laughs> yeah? I'm not. Or not that, but at least I'm not going to chug. I'm never going to chug alcohol again. Even if it's whiskey, I'll sip it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to chug. I'm going to. My relationship with alcohol is just going to be very different. Now. By the way, I had to do that because I told you guys you can only drink wine, so now I have to show you that. Let's get Kushmak in the right time. I just said you should, I know Shabbos did, but you're not chugging whiskey, you're sipping whiskey. Okay, how can I best tap into the spiritual energy that is inherent in the day of Purim? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what I think. This is the biggest teaching. I've ever heard, I'm going to share it with you. Everyone talks about Purim is the highest day of the year. The Heilige Arizal says Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippurim. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but that's what the Heilige Arizal says. And there's a supernal light coming down from the heavens. And it's the biggest day of the year, and you can't miss this amazing energy. It's coming down, especially when you're, if you read Bayam Darkecha, many of you have. Especially during the Megillah, you're reading the Megillah, and this awe. Oh, and soft aura is mamish being infused into your whole being. I'm like, who are you kidding, man? I'm not trying to hear every word. Like, Shh. Every, the halacha says, so I'm a Pasha Yid. And it says, Kala Pasha Yid, Night Nimla. Kala Pasha Yid, Kala Pasha Yid. Anyone who sticks out their hands, you should give to them. But it also means, anyone who's a simple Jew, give to them. So me, I don't feel all that. I'm not Rab Morgenstern. I don't get that. So as she says in Yom Dal Kecha, footnote 14, if you want to look at it, it says you've got to try and feel the awe, oh, mamish! But if you can't do that, just try to feel the general feeling of, hold on, there's something colour system. But if you can't even do that, lo yishba, don't feel broken, just ya amin, just believe that it's there. This is the best thing I've ever read in my life. Just believe that it's there. Someone went up to the Kotzka Rebbe, and said, my Rebbe is so holy that he can see the Ushbizin in, in his sukkah when Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, when they come, he can see them, he's so holy. Because the Rebbe said, that's great, they're very holy, but I'm even holy. Because I can't see them, but I, I believe that they're there. So for people on my passion level, I'm not the Bala Sulem I know, I don't want to. But I believe that there's this awe. I believe that there's... And I like, I just believe it. I believe it. I know it's there. I don't even feel it, really. But I believe it. And if you start really believing it, you just I know it's here. And then start saying to yourself, just over, I know it's here. And, and then start asking Hashem, please help me feel it. You should know that it's there. How do you get it into your heart? My Rebbe, the Bilbavi, says, what's in between your head and your heart is your mouth. 
So you've got to do two things. First, you just got to repeat it. It's like a, a cha, I call it a chazmel, chazarat milim. Say the words over and over again. I know there's an unbelievable life. I believe it's here, I believe it's here. And then you ask Hashem, please help me feel it. Help me feel it. I know it's here, help me feel it. I know it's here, help me. And hopefully then you get a little stickle feeling. But if even then you don't get a little stickle feeling, the Helega Belvavi says the most sweet thing ever that anyone's ever said. He says that he's like Yom Kippur. So in Yom Kippur, the Kayan Gadol goes into the Kadash Kadashim. Purim is greater than Yom Kippur. Why? Because on Purim, every year goes into the Kedesh Kedesh. Every year gets to have the highest relationship with Hashem. But, if you don't feel it, listen to this. It's the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my life. What's in the Kedesh Kedesh? The Arana Kedesh. What's in the Arana Kedesh? You've got the Luchot. You've got the tablets of stone. And you've got the broken ones. The broken Luchot are in there. So the Rebbe says the most unbelievable thing. He says, you can be broken and still be in the Kaddish Kaddish. You can be broken, and even more so maybe. Even more so, that's where you're in. So every broken, every, I don't feel, I don't feel this now, is, that's where Hashem is. In the brokenness, in the pain, in the person annoying. I'm trying to read the Megillah. Everything's, it's not going how I expected it. That's where Hashem is. When you play hide and seek, someone goes and hides somewhere, where are they? They are where they're hiding. They are where they're hiding. So when it's all going wrong and it's not, that's, that's the whole point of Purim, is to show you that Hashem's everywhere, not when everything's going great, when everything's not going great, when you don't feel it. Where do you feel it most? Well, you don't feel it. And you just surrender and you say, okay, if this is what, that's from Hashem too. I'm broken and that's okay, I'm still in the Kadesh Kadesh, even in my brokenness. So I just believe that, that's what Pashat Yid, that's what I do, until... I become a virus. Go to the mikvah. It's a good idea. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> On Purim? Yeah. Hey. Good morning. I think focus on the good, uh, even when it doesn't seem so good. And again, I'm going to focus on Binal Mechavero. Try to find something good in your in your fellow friends, in, uh, in the people around you, in the yeshiva, people you might have a broken relationship with back home. Uh, focus on the good. I think if you focus on the good, uh, that elevates uh, your relationship with them. It makes you happier. Um, focus on the good in your life. Uh, it makes you forget about uh, the bad. Uh, it makes you appreciate. And the whole purpose is to realize that everything's from Hashem, everything's for the good. You just focus on the good. I think that's a great way to feel the energy of Purim because Purim is a day when things that don't actually look so good are really good. And uh, that's how I think that you can tap into the energy. your favorite Purim memory? Favorite. No questions here? There's no questions? You've answered all the questions. You, all the questions. Go, you can have a question. Go. Favorite Purim memory. Favorite. Oh, not a question, just a statement. I love this panel. This was amazing. Oh, Thank you. We love you, Avram. <laughs> this was just like really awesome. Okay, favorite Purim memory. I think I said this out. That's um, what I was laughing before. Favorite Purim memory. You know what I'm so I get, I'm, I'm the spitam in the river. Every year, and I was in my <laughs> friend's house. We have we're very similar. Actually, we got four families every year. We just have these four families. All our kids are friends. We're all the same age. We all made yeah, it's very nice. Lots of drinking, lots of sweet Torah. But outside his house, we live in an area where there are lots of street parties. So there's a street party outside there, and I walked onto the balcony <laughs> of the street party. And I was like the and. I'm not going to say that story. Thank you so much. <laughs> when I was a young lad, before you were born, children, I was a dance music DJ, drum and bass and hard house in France, in, in London and Manchester. And I used to do lots of, I, I used to go clubbing. And there was a club called Cam Camden Palace. And Camden Palace, it basically was an old theater that they turned into a club. So it had uh, the, the balconies. balconies. 
and then the big crowd was down there. But I used to get on the bus the other day, and suddenly I was, I was like, I was in Canada. <laughs> and then all the, the street party, all these wild things going on. And then, I'm not joking, this is the biggest Hashkaka practice. They played a tune that they played back that I hadn't heard it for many, many And it's a tune that no one knows. It's a jungle tune. I don't know if you even know what jungle is in America. So I, I'm not even going to do it. I could not believe it. it was a, and then the whole crowd turns out all these secular Israel, all, these, all the cameras, they like, there's a bit of it. I think I ran away at that point. And for that point, I was like, yeah, it's a bit of a movie. It comes to the jungle house party <laughs> yeah. in Nachla Ois. <laughs> Live on the scene. I, I think the best moment I had, I, it, my, my father, the first time he met my Rebbe was Purim. And I just remember, my <laughs> all the lights were off, and it was, and my father just runs out, <laughs> my, my, my Rebbe runs out to my father. Ah, oh, my smashed my father in the face like, oh my goodness! <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you're the biggest. I don't think my father saw it coming, but it was like such a moment. Like, oh my, did that really happen? I hugged him and kissed my father, and then they were mamish best friends forever. Since then, my father's like, how's it going be all? How's it going be all? How's it? Since then, it was such a moment, you know. And my second. And a couple other ones is just watching my Rebbe bench on Purim. It took like three hours. There was so much crying and it was unbelievable. And I think also up there was singing Adelo Yadam for three or four hours in my Rebbe, Rebbe Dov there's basement on Purim, nonstop in Rebbe Shem Yochai's cave. My first Purim in Yerushalayim ever, I was in Rebbe Elsan's Shlita's Gemara Shir, and we had the Purim suit at your home. I don't know if you remember this. I was about no. to say, when you say your favorite memory in Purim, you're like, what memory? In Purim? <laughs> <laughs> I, read, the Emmis, I was at Rabbi Rasmus' house, Shlita, on Purim with Olive Gesher and Rabbi Elsan Shlita, who you, you, just the Kedu, you'll see, on the table, dancing, on a chair, I think it was another chair, on the chairs, jumping on chairs, on Rabbi Rasmus, broke the chairs, it was smashed everywhere. <laughs> Elton runs to run, throws him a 200 shekel on the spot, and thinking. <laughs> Ron's like, what am I going to do? It was so emistic. It was beautiful. <laughs> the M is beautiful. I had to play with the chair. I broke a chair at Rabbi Rasmus' house. <laughs> and that, beautiful. He is Rabbi Nachman. He's a chassid. Because he's actually butter for paying for that chair, as we learned earlier. But he's a chassid. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I just remember the one thing that... I remember a couple of things from your student. Um, it was amazing. <laughs> that was the first time I met your children, all the mishpacha. But uh, I remember in, you have a side yard, or in the, the front, kind of on the side. I remember we were just, yes, yeah, singing. I didn't know the words at that point, for sure not. And just singing and just and running around and just nigunim until we just collapsed on the on the grass. That was amazing. That's one thing that I remember. Another thing is, um, maybe some of you might know him a little bit. Most of you don't, it's a tragedy, but uh, maybe you'll meet him one day, uh, Rabbi Reber, uh, at his house, everybody completely just mekayim the mitzvah, and he would, he would go around the table from person to person, and every person that walked in, and he would give the best bracha from the heart. He had ruach HaKodesh, I'm not exaggerating. He, he had divine inspiration, and in, in front of everybody, no one remembers anyway, he would say the most personal, specific thing that you absolutely needed, and you would just burst out into tears and say, Amen, Rebbe, Amen, and just like think about, it, wow, mm. I hope this. And by the way, I just want to say, this is, there's, a, there's a, a tradition in our shir, those who have been students of this, his brachas come true. To the point that there was once a student, I'm not going to say his name, and he skipped him. He was going around and he skipped him. He did not give him a bracha. And then kind of we noticed, and at the end he was like, Rebbe, what about me? You have a bracha for me? So he gave him a little bracha, but he knew that what the student wanted was a shidduch. And he said, Rebbe, give me a bracha for a shidduch. And he said, no, no. And he, that this guy took it so to heart. And from that day, he knew, like, I'm not ready. Like, on Purim, he realized, I'm not ready. He thought he was ready, I'm not ready. And he died, and he died, and he dated, and he dated, and Baruch Hashem. But, but it's, it's like... Uh, that, that was amazing. And last but not least is at, at my house last year with the kids to see a three-year-old 
and a five-year-old. <laughs> I mean, we're, we are Russian, so no. But but at the end of the suda, after we benched, and that's when all the real fun starts. After we benched, and we're just really, really in the mitzvah land. And to see the three-year-old and the five and the five-year-old just singing <laughs> so pure, and everyone around is so mikhaim what they're saying, and everything is so pure and good. To be like that with your kids on a holy day, and your kids look back and say, Purim was amazing last year, Abba. No one got upset, no one got angry, no one's cursing, no one's screaming, and everyone in the house is completely beyond. That is such a special, special thing for me. That's a big memory. Little kids singing. Okay, final questions. Great, thanks.